Thank you very much. I am so honored to be here with all these wonderful speakers. Uh, uh, it's just a privilege, and I want to thank Lynn for this great opportunity to bring me over to talk to some of you. Um, can, can I have the lights down in the front? Uh, what I'm going to be talking about today is the foundation of something that's so exciting for this reason. We are in the process of an evolution right now. And the evolution is, uh, is going to be absolutely wonderful, except we have to go through a little bit of darkness on the way out of the old process and something coming in. So that what you're going to be seeing in the world and what you're experiencing in the world right now is an upheaval. It'll start uh, probably very profoundly in the United States within the year. And, uh, but why it's important for me to let people know this is that don't be focusing on the darkness that's happening. Be focusing on what is the consequence of the darkness, that we will create a planetary unity, which is a requirement. And it's interesting because we can't even uh, live on this planet with six and a half billion people. And yet we always want to know, well, how can we survive this? And the beautiful part uh, that I found was in understanding the biology is this, that when you look at yourself, you see yourself as an individual. Uh, but this is a misperception that you're actually a community of upwards to 50 trillion cells. Every cell is the equivalent of a miniature human. And the interesting thing is, here's a, a, a civilization under your skin with 50 trillion entities in it, and they can live in such blissed out harmony that if you're blissed out, 50 trillion citizens under your skin are blissed out. And it's very interesting because we're always looking for the answers, and there's an old saying, uh, look, to, you know, look inward, the answers, uh, look inward for the answers. And the, answer, the, the truth is, in fact, yes. If you look inwards and understand the nature of how 50 trillion cells can live in a community and apply that to the so many billion people on this planet, we will be able to experience the bliss and harmony that a happy human body can experience. And uh, we're not there yet, but this is an evolution that's in process right now. And the wonderful part is that every one of you will be in this evolution because it's unfolding within the next year or two. It'll start, and I think 2012 might be when this transformation might take place. So uh, rather than looking on the dark side when you start seeing things, please start looking past the dark into the beautiful thing that's going to happen, the unity of the planet. It's a biological evolution that we're going through. As you already can hear, I speak very quickly. So I prefer if you uh, take this website down, you can get free articles, download articles on the stuff I'm talking about. Just download them with record it, and their references and everything else are in there as well, okay? The question I want to start off is, uh, who are we? <laughs> and, and it's important because from a biological point of view, you've been given the impression that you're some kind of frail vehicle of biology, that everything can attack you, viruses, bacteria, you know, sugar, don't eat white sugar, that'll kill you, all these kinds of things. And this is the belief that we've walked into of our frailty. But the truth is, are we really that frail? So for example, you can see people walk across fire. And that doesn't really predict frailty to me. Uh, you've also probably seen reports of uh, a woman lifting a car to get a child out from underneath a trapped vehicle. Imagine that, a woman who is not even trained, just not even an athletic woman, can get out there and lift up over 1,000 pounds or more and hold up a vehicle to get a car out. That's not a frail person either. Another thing that's interesting, and this is an example of what's happening in the United States and in, uh, in the Deep South, we have some Pentecostal Baptist uh, uh, people down there that work themselves up in a religious ecstasy state. And in that ecstasy state, they testify that God protects them. And then to testify to that, some of them play with poisonous vipers like rattlesnakes and copperhead snakes. And that's pretty interesting because even if they get bitten, they don't really have any consequences of it. But that's really mild compared to some of them because some of them actually drink strychnine in toxic doses to demonstrate that God protects them. And they actually have no harmful effects from drinking strychnine. So when you think about this, you can walk across fire, you can lift up thousands of pounds without thinking about it, you can drink poison. This doesn't really sound like a frail human being. But the issue is then, are these extraordinary people? No, they're just everyday average people. But what's extraordinary about them is this, they have a belief. They have a belief in what they do, unshakable belief. And with that belief, they do miracles. And the issues are that we have to understand that we are far more powerful, except we bought other kinds of beliefs that actually disenfranchise us. And this is what I want to talk about, because the idea is we bought into a system of our frailty and that we really blame our genes for most of the problems that we have. 
And the simple reality is this. You are not controlled by your genes. You're controlled by your beliefs. And you will be able to do all these miracles and more and better than these people if you believe you can. And that comes out, obviously, I paraphrase somebody else saying that. <laughs> and the reality about this is that we have to understand what's going on and how this belief works and how a belief of disempowerment is the same as a belief as empowerment. And so I want to start off with the fact that I told you you are a community of upwards to 50 trillion cells. Well, here's a very interesting fact, that there is not one new function in this entire human body that's not already present in every single cell. You show me a physiological system in here, and I'll show you where it is in there. Every cell has a digestive, a respiratory, an excretory, an endocrine system, a nervous system, reproductive, musculoskeletal system. Every cell has an immune system. So what's really interesting is this. A cell is, in precise terms, a miniature person that they do all the same things that you do, and they live in this giant community inside of you. And we bought a story. We bought a story, and it's called the medical model. And the medical model is that you're just a biochemical machine, and you're controlled by genes. So we bought this as a truth about ourselves. And in doing this, we've also disempowered ourselves, and I'll explain why during the rest of the presentation. The question is, how do we buy such a model and buy it with such, you know, uh, we, we own it with such passion, we won't even let go of the concept? Where did we get this model from? Well, it started with the advent of modern science and really founded in the work of Isaac Newton. Now, Isaac Newton came into the world at a time when the spiritual uh, body called the church was trying to provide us with truths about the universe. And we believed at that point in everything being the invisible world of God and spirits and all kinds of stuff like that to try to understand what was going on in the world. However, when Isaac Newton came in, he was uh, part of the forefront of a new science that was trying to look at the world outside of that spiritual context. There was a belief at that time that was actually uh, founded by Rene Descartes that the world and the universe was like a clock. I mean, look, you can tell time by the sun moving across the heavens and the planets and stars moving in, in, in the sky. So they started to see it as a clockwork mechanism. Isaac Newton created differential calculus to try to study the movement of the planetary system. And in his differential calculus equation, for example, in studying the movement of the moon around the Earth, he included these factors. He included the physical character of the, of the moon, the mass. He also put in gravity, which was associated with the physical character. The more mass something had, the more gravity it had. So it was a direct connection with mass. He put in how fast these bodies were moving through space. And by doing this, he was able to accurately predict the movement of the universe. Well, the science is really built on the fact of can you identify a truth, and the truth was based on a scientific assessment that yielded predictability. And because he was able to accurately predict the movements of the universe, science accepted his understanding of how the universe operated. Why is this important? The answer is when you look at the equation, where is God? There was no God in the equation. What about invisible forces, spirit, and stuff like that? No, that's not in the equation either. So basically what Newton ended up with is saying, you can understand the nature of the universe by just studying the physical character of the universe. You don't have to invoke uh, God, spirits, and invisible forces in this concept. So we bought into a concept of materialism. And the fact is that the universe is a machine. And if you want to understand how it works, just study the matter and don't bring in the invisible stuff. And this is the separation when science and the church split domains and realms. The church says, we'll study and work with the invisible realm. And science says, we don't even need the invisible realm. We'll just work with the material realm. And everything became a matter of matter as a result of Newton's work. But everything in the universe then, according to Newton, would be part of this machine. And that, of course, included the human body. The human body was also now called a machine. And in understanding the nature of a machine, uh, then we start to recognize the mechanical character of life. Well, this had a profound effect on something that Rene Descartes came up with, because Descartes came up with the concept, yes, there's a body. We are very familiar. You can see that, the physical thing right here. But Descartes came up with, of course, cogito ergo sum, I think, therefore I am, which implicated the concept of a mind and a body. Well, this mind-body duality was the subject of a lot of stuff until Isaac Newton came in. And Isaac Newton's stuff said, wait a minute, separate the invisible forces from the material world. 
And then he said, but the concept of vital forces is not relevant in the universe. All that's relevant is the material realm. So when you understand the concept of Newtonian physics, which is based on matter only, then that really means that you get rid of the vital forces, you get rid of the mind, and the rest of medicine is now based on a Newtonian understanding. He says you have a physical body, there's a mind, but that's totally irrelevant. That's just a consequence of the physical body and doesn't influence the body. So medicine, ever since this time, has disregarded the role of the mind in understanding the nature of biology. Now, of course, it's been hard to disregard that because there's something called the placebo effect. And of course, that's really about how your beliefs influence what's coming out. But then medicine takes care of this because what they do is they give you about 15 minutes of placebo information in medical education, and then they ask you to kindly forget that information as you go through the rest of medical school. So they can easily drop the mind out of the picture. However, this has been a basic problem because we then perceive the body as totally a physical machine. But in the concept of it being a physical machine, the mission statement of science was altered because they said if it's a machine, you could take it apart, understand how all the parts work together, and if you understand how the parts work, you can adjust the parts, and if you adjust the parts, you can adjust the operation of the machine. And if you can adjust the operation of the machine, you can control the machine. And so basically, the mission statement of science, actually since the time of Francis Bacon, was to obtain knowledge that can be used to dominate and control nature. Wow, big idea, very stupid idea, but we're paying for that, that little error right now, uh, that we can control nature. Yeah, we're controlling it right down the drain, essentially, at this point. But the issue is, this is the mission statement of science. Take things apart and understand how it works. Because if you can find where the control is, then you can dominate nature. But the issue is nobody really had any idea where the heck that control was really to be found. And then along comes Charlie Darwin, and Charles says this, <laughs> something very obvious to the people at that time, because before television and all the other Game Boys and things like that, people's entertainments primarily included breeding animals and plants. And so when he spoke to the fact that the traits of, the, of an individual are connected to the traits of the parents, Everybody at that time says, yeah, that seems pretty obvious. Look, we breed a lot of plants and animals. We can see that already. Yeah, but then you take this very important fact, and you say, wait, biology is a mechanical machine, and therefore the traits are passed from the parent to the child. Well, the things that's being passed from parent to child are sperm and egg, and somewhere in there must be the mechanical things that control life because that's what they were looking for, something mechanical. So by setting up this idea, that the control is going to be found in the germ cells, it really focused science on saying what is in those germ cells that control the traits of an organism. And this led a search that uh, materialized within 100 years. Within 100 years, we started to come across the understanding, of course, as we mentioned, uh, in the neighborhood here, uh, that DNA turned out to be the molecule that was associated with the control of life. And there's an unfortunate part about this story, and I'll just mention it right now, is this. Good science, the way I see it, is a scientist asks a question and then open to an answer by letting the experiments reveal an answer. Bad science, in my point of view, is already having the conclusion and then asking science to support your conclusion. So they already said, we know what we're looking for. It's going to be a mechanical thing inside the cell, and it's going to control life. And so that focus preceded the experiments. And so by the time Watson and Crick came up with this, it was already a given that they were going to find the molecule that controlled life. And so how does this molecule essentially control life? And the answer is this. As we'll explain a little bit deeper in a few minutes, the human body is like a mechanism. It's composed of building blocks, and the primary building blocks that give us our structure and our functions are called proteins. These are very complex molecules, and there's at least 150,000 and perhaps even up to a million different protein building blocks that make up your life. The proteins are very complex molecules, and they turn over kind of quickly, meaning that they have a life period and then they, they have to be replaced. So the issue that scientists wanted to know was, hey, who designs the proteins and how do you replace them? Because if you understood that, then you'd understand the nature of the control of the traits because the traits are provided by the proteins. But who controls the proteins? Well, it came out the belief that DNA 
is the blueprint, and that's what it represents, a blueprint for the proteins. And it's very interesting because in the spiral helix, you see the staircase going up the spiral helix. If you break the helix into one single helix, uh, then you can see that these steps going up the helix right here, they're I've indicated with four different colored bases is what they're called, A, T, G, and C, if you're familiar with the letters. Uh, the, the sequence of the colored bases along the DNA determine the pattern of the protein. So that DNA is a blueprint, that's exactly what it is. And from this understanding, they led to the fact that DNA controls the protein and the proteins express the traits. Well, Francis Crick, so enamored with the idea and also having 100 years of previous information that this is the molecule that they'll find that controls life, came up with a hypothesis. The hypothesis is called the central dogma. And the central dogma, as illustrated here, is the equivalent of the Ten Commandments of biology. And in this central dogma, the belief is your source is DNA. You are the protein. You're the protein. Yeah, but what determines the protein? You go back up the, the, the list here, and you see that DNA is at the top. And that they suggested that information went in one direction, from DNA down to the protein. So it was a uniform understanding that your life as protein was determined by that DNA. Now, this was an interesting concept, but here's what the issue was. It was a hypothesis, and that was back in the 50s. Well, what's the problem? Well, it seems so right. Why? Because they already had the answer in their mind before they did the experiment anyway. So when the DNA came up, everybody just accepted that. And it was repeated from the 50s to the 60s to the 70s to the 80s to the 90s to 2000. And the only problem is this. It was a hypothesis from day one. It was never a scientific fact. It was just expected, so we bought it. And we bought it and repeated it so long that we forgot that it was a hypothesis. We bought it as a truth, and we've been living by this so-called truth, which was a hypothesis, uh, ever since. And the unfortunate part about this is it is totally incorrect. And yet we bought it as our truth. And why has it become important? Because belief runs biology. And if you buy the belief that you are controlled by your genes, then, of course, you end up being controlled by your genes. Now, the issue about this is that it's called the central dogma. And it was funny because not until the year I left the university did I actually stop long enough to say, what the heck does dogma? What does that mean, dogma? And I looked it up in the dictionary one day, and I was totally shocked. Because the definition of the word dogma is a belief based on religious persuasion and not scientific fact. And all of a sudden, I realized, my god, for 20 years, I was teaching religion in medical school. <laughs> Another word for central dogma is called primacy of DNA. And primacy means first cause. So it says this, you tell me about an issue in your life, I'll tell you about the first cause. The first cause is genetics, DNA. So we bought into this. We bought into this in the fact that genes control life. Nobody questions this, OK? So what does that lead us to? Well, it leads us to this understanding as illustrated in this cover of Life magazine, were you born that way? It turns out we attribute to DNA not just the physical characters, but we attribute to the DNA the behavioral and the emotional characteristics of an individual as well. And the concept of this genes controlling life is referred to as genetic determinism. Genes determine who you are. So we bought this. But now I ask you a question. As far as you know, did you pick the genes that you have when you got here on this planet? Probably not. OK, as far as you know right now, can you change the genes if you're not really happy with what you ended up with? And the answer is, no, you can't do that either. So basically, it says, your life is controlled by genes. You didn't pick them. You can't change them. What does that make you? And the answer is, uh, it makes you a victim. You're a victim of heredity. You know, you get, you're lazy, and you go to your job, and your boss yells at you for being lazy. You say, come on, come on, give me a break, boss. You know why? My father was lazy, <laughs> and my grandfather was a sloth. So what do you expect from me? It's genetics, you know? I can't do anything about it. I'm a victim of this. And so we buy into the nature of victim, and we all bought into that. Anything that goes wrong with us it had nothing to do with you. It had everything to do with your genes and your heredity that did all this stuff. Well, this becomes very interesting in this regard, because we start reading articles like, I love this, when fat attacks. Uh, here, look at this, how fat cells are waging war on your health. And here's the issue. 
is like this whole concept of survival of the fittest even runs down to your cells are trying to kill you. And the reality is that we live in this war on war world. And the significance about that is we buy into it. Uh, just to illustrate this, I, I want a, a little excerpt of this uh, video. I hope that the sound comes across. Well, if you're quiet, we can listen to it. Uh, and I just love this because listen to the words on this ad. With a few months, no matter what you do, you just can't get rid of excess body fat. It's not your fault. Many of us have simply given up the hope to lose weight. Body fat builds over our midsection on top of the muscle underneath the skin. And over the years, it gets worse. Body fat increases from having kids, stress at work, lack of exercise, and poor diet. The Obesity Research Institute has found the solution. It's called Liber Games. What's even more amazing is that people are not asked to change their daily lives. This is the cause of overweight, poor diet, lack of exercise, stress at work. Which part is not your fault? <laughs> the nature of the drug industry is not to heal you. The nature of the drug industry, said, as she said, it says, okay, be a jerk, eat anything you want, don't do, you know, just stress yourself out. It doesn't make a difference. Live that life. All you have to do is take liposine. And basically, this is the nature of the pharmaceutical industry. You would think the pharmaceutical industry is out there to help us. Well, first, stop and think about it this way. The pharmaceutical industry is a corporation. What is the function of a corporation? Money. To make money. And the reality is this, if they heal you, they don't make money. And in fact, corp big giant pharmaceutical companies actually have very effective drugs. They don't sell them. They put them on the shelf for the reason is this, they prefer to sell you the less effective drugs and to keep you on drugs than to let you get well. And as the advertisement says is, it's not your fault, so just take drugs. And in the U.S., because they advertise this stuff on television every 15 minutes, almost everyone in the States is on one, two, or three pharmaceutical drugs just to wake up and to go to sleep at night. They bought into the story, and they find themselves as victims of things beyond their control, and this is what they believe. Well, then, how do we get out of this? So the concept of the Human Genome Project came up. And the concept of the Human Genome Project is if we could find a list of all the genes that make a human, then what we'll be able to do is then engineer anybody. You come into my office, you got a problem, I'll tell you which gene it is, and we genetically engineer you. That's the story you were told, that this is inevitably where we're gonna go. We'll fix anything. Uh, just a little sidebar. Even I was taken by this because when the project started coming up in our discussion in labs, it seemed like a great humanitarian project. This was not a humanitarian project. This was a project that was sponsored by venture capitalists for this reason. They figured there were over 100,000 different genes, over 150,000, and to them, every gene was a future drug. And what they thought about was if we did the Human Genome Project, patent the genes, then we can sell the genes to the pharmaceutical industry for research in making new drugs. This is the exact reason why the project got off the ground, and they were beautiful at it. Why? Because they convinced you it was a humanitarian project, and guess what? You freely donated your money to carry out this project, and every gene that was found has now been patented by a private company. So your genes are actually owned by other people. And the reality is, wow, this was, this was going to be great, because once we did this, we understand how the human works. I love it because the universe doesn't let them get away with this. And here's why. Because before the project got off the ground, in order to make a human under the understanding that we worked with, it took over 150,000 genes to make a structure as complex as a human that has consciousness and all the functions that we express. And here's what the problem was. When the results came out, there were only 23,000 genes found. And why is this a problem? The answer is, well, the model of how it works says you have to have 150,000. There's 125,000 genes are missing. <laughs> and the problem is, it's not that the genes are missing. Biology was wrong. It was completely misunderstanding what this was all about. 
And now what are they trying to get to? Well, ignore the fact that they were wrong. They're trying to sell you a gene chip. It's sort of like a genetic lottery. You go and get your genes tested, and they'll look on the gene strip, and they'll tell you what kind of disease you're going to end up having. And the truth is, it is a total waste of money because it doesn't work. Even Craig Venter, who is one of the uh, predominant architects of the Human Genome Project, just had his human genome, his genome, completely assessed, far greater than, than a gene chip can show you. And guess what he said? He said, after looking at the results, he said, you couldn't even tell if I was going to have blue eyes by looking at this gene. And, and, and then it's funny because in the quote he said that he laughed and then said, we thought it was going to be much more simple than this. And the reality is, no, you cannot tell what you're going to end up with in your life by looking at your genes. And there's only a few diseases, a handful, probably less than six, that you actually have any insight into by looking at your genome. All the rest of the stuff is not based on your genes. It's based on how you respond to the environment. And all of a sudden it says, well, that becomes very, very important for the simple reason. It says, you're not controlled by your genes. You're controlled by your response to the environment. It's the environment that overrides genes. So this is a new understanding that we're coming from. And yet we bought in the idea that the genes control life. And so when we look at a cell, we see a structure called the nucleus. And in that nucleus are the genes. And what we understand is because our belief system says genes control life, and the genes are essentially all uh, deposited or uh, left in this nucleus, that the nucleus represents the source of control. So we bought into the belief. It's in textbooks everywhere, right? It's a second. Go around anywhere and pick up a biology book. The nucleus controls the function of the cell. Yeah, but why did they say that? And the answer is because the genes are in the nucleus. And the genes control life, so the nucleus as the repository of genes represents a structure that controls life. In many books, they actually go on and admit another fact about this nucleus that controls life. Because remember I told you that a cell and a human were like identical images of each other? Wherever you have an organ in your body, a cell has a thing called an organelle, which is just Latin for miniature organ. So where you have an organ, a cell has an organelle. So the issue is this. We say that the nucleus controls life. They say that the nucleus in the book is the brain of the cell. So when we look at a, a nucleus and a human, or cell and a human, we represent that the nucleus and the brain represent one and the same. Then I ask you a question, and it really concerns this. What if you take a brain out of an organism and throw it away? The answer is either the organism dies or it becomes George Bush. I'm not really sure what, <laughs> <laughs> what the issue is. <laughs> But the reality is we bought the story that the nucleus controls life and nucleus is the brain. But then the fact is, no, truthfully, if you do take the brain out of an organism and throw it away, it dies. So it says if the nucleus is the brain, then if I remove the nucleus from the cell, it would be the same as removing the brain from the cell. It's a process called enucleation. And the idea is, well, what would you expect to happen? The answer is I expect the cell to die. Uh-oh, wrong expectation. Because you can remove the genes from a cell, and many cells can live for two or more months with no genes. They're not just sitting there. They're breathing. They're eating. They're defecating. They're moving around. They're recognizing and interacting with other cells. They avoid toxins in the environment. Their lives go on totally unaffected, even though there are no genes in them. Now, they may last up to two months with no genes in them. And the issue is this. Well, if the genes are controlling life, that's what we said, then what is controlling life in a cell that has no genes? And the answer is, well, obviously not the genes. <laughs> so the reality is this. The brain of the cell is not the nucleus. Why? Because you throw away the nucleus, it doesn't affect the behavior. The behavior still goes on. There's another thing that's the brain, not the nucleus. Then you might say, well, Bruce, you know, what is that giant thing called the nucleus? It must be doing something. It's very, very big. And the reality is, is, what is the nucleus? Well, here's what happens. When you take the nucleus out of the cell, something does happen. Here's what it is. The cell cannot replace the proteins. Why? Because the DNA are the blueprints for the proteins. So you throw away the blueprints, you can't replace the proteins. So the cell can't reproduce the proteins, and the cell itself can't reproduce. And all of a sudden, you say, well, wait, reproduction? The nucleus function is reproduction? Well, then all of a sudden it says, yes, the nucleus is the gonad, not the brain. <laughs> but the reality is <laughs> science is a male-dominated profession. <laughs> uh, 
Since males think with that, of course, that's how it became the brain. <laughs> but the reality is a fact. And here's the fact. This is, a, this is a fact. Genes do not control biology. And yet we predicated an entire science of medicine and health on the fact that genes control biology. What would be the consequence of doing that? What would be the consequence of an error, something as grave as that? I'll tell you what the consequences are. In the United States, I would like to list the leading causes of death. Number three is cancer, 553,000 people die per year. Number two is cardiovascular disease with 700,000 people dying per year. And the leading cause of death, and I wish I had a drum roll, brrrm, leading cause of death, iatrogenic illness. And you say, what the hell is iatrogenic illness? It's a way of disguising a truth. Iatrogenic illness means illness as a result of medical treatment, meaning you go to the doctor with complaint A, you get treated, you die from problem B. The issue is this, medicine in the United States is the leading cause of death with 784,000 people dying every year. Obviously, we should look at that. They looked at it and said, that's the cost of doing medicine. Well, that's a hell of a cost if you're one of the 784,000 people. And the reality is this, it is not the medical doctor's fault. It's a completely not their fault. Why? I was part of the fault. I was the academic end of teaching medicine. And we teach doctors what information that we thought we knew. And as a consequence, they can only practice to the level of what we teach. And therefore, if you limit the information, then you limit the ability of a doctor to be a healer. And the limitations do not come from academia. The truth, the limitations come from the pharmaceutical industry. And the reason is, they have a vested interest in selling drugs. If you could heal yourself without drugs, they will not make the profit. If they don't make the profit, then you don't have a corporation. So the reality is, we have been misdirected and misguided, and don't pay attention to mind and energy and all that other woo-woo stuff. And every time you see an article about woo-woo stuff, you see big article about that, and then you also see big article about genes controlling life, and genes controlling this, and genes controlling that. In other words, it's a shill game. Keep your eye off of the truth and focus on what we want you to focus on. And the reality is, the belief system is so wrong that medicine itself is the leading cause of death. So the concept of the medical model, biochemical machine controlled by genes, ah, totally incorrect. But I started to get a hold of this and understanding back 40 years ago. Whew, uh, you're very familiar with the concept of stem cells, right? That's like this recent thing that just hit the world, stem cells. And here's an interesting fact. What are stem cells? They're the equivalent of embryonic cells. Your body is completely filled with stem cells all over the place. They can replace any tissue or organ in your body. There used to be a time where we thought only certain organs could be replaced. We used to think, for example, the heart couldn't regenerate or the brain couldn't regenerate. Now we know those are totally false. Stem cells are found in every tissue and organ. But the interesting thing is apparently they don't work for us. So what do we have to do? We have to give them the pharmaceutical company because the pharmaceutical company will figure out how to make them work. And I ask you a question. Do you think God gave you stem cells only to wait until the pharmaceutical company figured it out? <laughs> the issue is this. If you have stem cells, then why aren't they working for you? And the answer is, it's not because of genetics. It's because of belief. And if you believe you can't heal yourself, if you believe in aging, and you believe in your inability to control your life, that is why you stop the action of stem cells. But I want to tell you about what I learned from stem cells because they are profoundly important. So back in 1967, I was cloning stem cells 40 years ago. Nobody was working on stem cells, just a few of us. And here's what I found. I'd create a culture dish with stem cells in it. And under the culture medium I used, the cells would divide and make more stem cells and make more stem cells. But then I realized this. If I took the cells out of my stem cell culture dish and put it into another culture dish and changed the culture medium, the environment, uh, let's say I put in culture dish A with conditions A, the stem cells form muscle. 
And I say, well, you know, that's an interesting experiment, but let's go back to this culture dish, and why is this important? I cloned the stem cells, meaning all the cells in the dish were genetically identical. So we're starting with genetically identical cells, and here's what I do. I now take some cells from the same genetical uh, clone, genetic clone as these cells, put them in another Petri dish with a different environment, and they form bone. I say, yeah, here's a better experiment. Take the same cells, put it in Petri dish C with yet a different environment, and boom, they form fat. Now here's the big question, and you don't have to be a rocket scientist to get this right. What is it that controls the fate of the cells? The environment. They're genetically identical. It's only the environment that changes. So I got all excited. I published this paper way back in 1977. Uh, and, and the interesting part about this is in, in scientific Latin, uh, that's the way we publish scientific papers to keep you from understanding what the hell we do. <laughs> of course, we're the new church. That's why we did what the other church did. Put it in Latin. Nobody knows what we're talking about. Uh, what I talked about was the fact that by changing the environment of stem cells, you change their expression, and this uh, was met by my colleagues as heresy. Why? Because we have dogma, and you are violating the dogma, you're a heretic. So essentially, I started trying to talk up my colleagues about this, and they didn't want to hear about this. It's like an anomaly, because we're into genes, and you're the only guy in the department that's not working with genes. So you've got to be something wrong with you. So essentially, uh, at some point, I felt very uncomfortable being around these people who I thought were no longer really good scientists for the reason is this. They saw the results, they saw the experiments, and they just wanted to disregard it because it didn't fit the picture that they were working on. So I walked out of the university. And I left, and I, I, I had tenure, and I was kind of stupid because that was a great job for life, <laughs> and I, I walked away from that. Uh, I. I in my weirdness, I, I produced a rock and roll show. Uh, maybe you heard of the musician. I found Yanni. Some, you know, he was a, I found that. that was a, I lost a lot of money. That was bad. And there I was a, a few years later thinking I would love to have a job. <laughs> and I thought maybe I'll apply back to university again. And I figured, well, since I was at a major university, University of Wisconsin, that maybe I should apply for a, a lower university because not, they don't really look you know, kindly upon people who walk out of the university system. So I applied to a bunch of mediocre universities. I got turned down by all of them, so I thought, oh God, now I did it. And as the way the universe works, I get a call from a friend of mine at Stanford. Now I would have never applied to Stanford, that was even above Wisconsin. So I didn't apply there. And I end up uh, getting an invitation to go to Stanford. And uh, uh, I was really totally surprised. And I end up showing up with two carousels of slides. One carousel of slides is about my muscle research, which, man, I, that, that was solid and published work. There's no problem. I could have gotten a good job off of that. And my other carousel of slides was the new weird biology. And I'm walking up to the projector with my friend Glenn, and I said, Glenn, um, which one of these should I use? And he looked at me and said, don't be a fool, man. Put the stuff down about muscle. You need a job. So I was going <laughs> to just put that carousel down, and all of a sudden my other hand went boom. <laughs> I looked at him, he looked at me, it was kind of weird, and I said, I, I guess that's what I'm going to talk about. <laughs> so I get up in the front of the room and I look at the audience and then I freak out. I freak out because there's the chairman of biochemistry, the chairman of pathology, the chairman of biology, there was the head of Genentech research, genetic engineers, the top genetic engineers of the world, and I'm standing in front of them with a talk about genes not being that important. <laughs> and as you can see, I, I lecture without any notes and Sometimes the words just come in, you know, someplace. And I was just concluding my talk, and I was writing on the board a conclusion, and the words come into my head, and I'm chuckling back there. They can't see me. I think, oh, these are funny words. And I turn around, and I say to the audience, therefore, in conclusion, if you think genes are the end all of everything, you're no better than a fundamentalist. Whoa. Whoa. <laughs> Boom, I got blown against the blackboard. <laughs> All these people were apoplectic, red, yelling at me. They didn't want any answers. They just wanted to vent. And I'm going blown up against the blackboard. <laughs> and they're all yelling. And, and all of a sudden, it's like somebody turned the volume down. And I'm watching people yelling and stuff like that. And, and the interesting reality is as they're saying that, that same voice came back into my head and said, this job interview isn't going well, is it, Bruce? <laughs> <laughs> I started slipping down the blackboard. <laughs> And my belt catches on the chalk tray. 
And that meant a sign from the universe that's as low as you have to go. <laughs> you don't have a job, so I started yelling back at them. And the interesting thing was they got quiet real fast because there were some very interesting facts that they didn't want to talk about. Number one, life was here on this planet before DNA was on this planet. Well, right away it says, then what was controlling life? It sure as hell wasn't DNA. And that was a bunch of, I can't remember the other stuff that was, uh, <laughs> and the interesting thing was at the end, I stood there in like frigid thinking, oh my God. And they actually applauded, which was really surprising. <laughs> and then they gave me a job. And the beautiful part about that is I carried out the same research that I did in Wisconsin, but on a much more sophisticated level. And I get uh, the cover of differentiation with my cells on the front of my clones of human stem cells and how they're affected by the environment. <clears throat> of course, I wanted the cover of Rolling Stone magazine. <laughs> <laughs> But you accept what you can get. <laughs> and so I published this work and then realized my colleagues at Stanford were exactly like my colleagues at Wisconsin. Great idea, we don't want to talk about it. So I said, cool, I left the university for the second time. And this time I decided to write a book. So I write the book and as it says in the introduction, I describe what chapter two is all about. Chapter two, it says here, I lay out the scientific evidence to show you genes do not control biology. I also introduce you to the exciting discovery of epigenetics, a new field of biology that is unraveling the mysteries of how the environment influences the behavior of cells without changing the genetic code. This is a new field now. This field wasn't named when I was doing the work but my work was in part of uh, you know, the pioneering uh, of this understanding of epigenetics, but we didn't have a name for it, so I didn't use it then. So I write chapter two, which is on this, and I, what do I call it? It's the environment, stupid. And it's really a, a takeoff on Bill Clinton's uh, presidential campaign. It's the economy, stupid. So I figure that's a cool name, I write that. And uh, it's all about what? Stem cells being altered by their environment. And then a few months after the book comes out, this article appeared, oh, I, I forgot to say this, when the book did come out, people looked at me and said, Bruce, uh, what the bleep do you know about this stuff? You know, you're not part of a university. It's sort of like when I left the university, I immediately got stupid, and so <laughs> nobody would trust me because I didn't say it was any university anymore. But the interesting part was that an article comes out in one of the most prestigious journals in the world, Nature, which is published here in Great Britain, and the interesting thing is, what's this article about? Stem cells are engaged in a constant crosstalk with their environment. Biologists are fast realizing. Well, some of them not so fast, obviously. <laughs> and so they're talking about the nature of re wrestling uh, with the ecological concept of a niche, that the environment is controlling. So Nature is writing an article that the environment controls the uh, cells. What do you think they call this article? I just love it. It's ecology, stupid! <laughs> So basically, I feel very much vindicated today because in fact, this is where the biology is going. It's the environment that controls biology. So basically, right now then, I wanna talk to you about how biology works. And to do that, then we'll start talking about cells because if you understand how a cell works, you understand how a human works. So here's the interesting thing. How does a cell work? And the answer is very basically simple. That I said that it's made out of proteins, up to 150,000 different kinds of proteins. The proteins act like gears in a machine. So if you understand how a cell works, it's basically trying to understand the nature of how gears engage with each other to create functions. And if you understand the nature of the gears, then you'll understand the nature of the functions. So we take a cell apart, and we look in the cell, we find that the 150,000 gears are these organic things called proteins. They don't look like human gears, man-made gears, but they are exactly like gears. They engage with each other. Each protein has its own structure, and each protein has its own particular function. So the relevance is, oh, how, does, how does it work? Where does the structure or function come from? And it looks like this. Here are three examples of protein. These are uh, molecular uh, uh, studies based on, on the actual uh, X-ray diffraction patterns and the molecular assessment of, of these protein molecules. And I said, well, each one has a unique shape. Where does the shape come from? And the answer is, underneath the calm exterior, each protein has something the equivalent of a backbone. And the backbone gives shape to the protein. Now, here's the point. So I'm gonna give you the five minute uh, protein biochemistry course, and it's all you need, really, five minutes. 
<laughs> and it works like this. All proteins, and there's over 150,000 of them, all proteins are the same in this regard. All proteins are linear strings. The strings are made out of beads, so I'm using a poppet bead model. But let me tell you what the beads are. The beads are called amino acids. There are 20 different kinds of amino acids. Each amino acid has its own shape. Okay, first quiz. How many different shapes of amino acids are there? 20, okay. Why this becomes not a very good model now? Because my poppet beads all look exactly the same, so it looks like a uniform string. So take the concept that a uh, chain of amino acids is the backbone of a protein, but now let's look at, the, the use a different model for the amino acids. Instead of poppet beads, I'm gonna show you three different pipe fittings. Uh, uh, can we have the lights on just for a second while I show this part in the front? So instead of uh, 20 different amino acids, because all I can show is only about three of them, it's all I can juggle in my hands right now, I'm gonna start with three different shapes. I have a yellow amino acid, which is straight. I have a uh, blue amino acid with a 90 degree bend. And I have a red amino acid with a 45 degree bend. That's three shapes out of how many? 20, 20. cool. Okay, so how do they work? Well, they work like poppet beads. You stick them together. This is called a peptide bond, protein bond. So I start to assemble them, and all of a sudden you start to see, yes, I'm getting a linear backbone, but guess what? It's not the flexible backbone you saw with poppet beads. It now has a rigidity to it because each amino acid has its own particular shape, and when you assemble them, it's not a uniform poppet bead chain. So now when I hold this up to you, I show you a rigid backbone of a protein that's built by a sequence of amino acids. I ask you one important question. If you get this, then you understand where we're going. If I disassemble, this backbone, and reassemble it in a different sequence, will I get the same shape, yes or no? <laughs> so basically, and the complexity is not just three amino acids, 20 amino acids, so the complexity of a backbone can be very, very great. Each protein has its own unique sequence, so the amino acids are following a sequence. So what the hell is the DNA? It's the blueprint and the sequence of what are called the bases along the DNA, tell me the sequence of the amino acids that make up the backbone. That's what a DNA blueprint is. It just tells me how to make a protein. So basically, we look at these proteins and we recognize there are 150,000 different versions of these proteins. And how do they work? Well, the best way of looking at how these proteins work is to consider the reality that the proteins act like a clock, an old-fashioned watch mechanism. Well, how does that work? Well, in your mind, can you imagine when this gear turns, it turns this gear, and when this gear turns, it turns that gear? Can you imagine that motion in your mind? Just like the video we saw before. But this time, instead of the metal machine, let's use proteins as gears. Now I ask you, in your mind, can you imagine that when this protein turns here, it turns that protein, which then turns that protein? Can you imagine that? <laughs> then I say, okay, throw away all the man-made parts. What are you left with? Protein machine, and these are gears that move. And I said, well, what are the functions of the gears when they move? And the answer is, whatever they were designed to do. Gears can drive a, a car. Gears can make an elevator go up and down. Uh, gears can make a wearing blender spin so you can have a margarita. Uh, and basically it says they're all gears, but if you design different gears, you get different functions. Does that make sense? So that basically then the gears, when they interact, can create different functions. The gears interacting create what are called pathways. So if I said this, see if you can put this picture in your head. Respiration pathway. What do you think that represents? The answer, a group of protein gears that when they turn, they create respiration. Okay, that was a hard one. Let's do an easier one. <laughs> I saw you had trouble with that. Digestive pathway. <laughs> a group of gears, when they turn, do digestion. And if you can figure that, then you can figure the harder one, muscle contraction pathway. <laughs> okay, so finally what you're recognizing is this. The functions of your biology are created by protein gears moving, and when they move, they express the function. Ah, move. Yes. What causes the movement? Relevance to that question. The environment, signals from the environment. Exactly right. Why is this important? Because this is the story of the secret of life. I'm gonna show you the secret of life right now. But when I show it to you, don't get irritated with me because you might think some like bright light is gonna come from the sky and light this whole place up. No, it's not. 
The secret of life is simple. And it works like this. This is a protein backbone. Just like your own backbone, you can twist it, you can bend it, you can flex it, and as you flex and twist, you change the shape. So guess what? My protein, like a backbone, can twist and bend and change its shape. Okay? I'm going to show you two shapes. I'm going to ask you which one do you think is the more stable of the two? Shape one or shape two? You can't answer the question, so don't even try. But I'll give you one fact, and then you'll have a better answer to the question. The fact is this. The two yellow amino acids at the end are both negatively charged. They're both negative. Shape one or shape two, which is, which is more stable? <laughs> two. The reason why, one, if they're like charges, they repel each other. So the farther apart they are, the more stable it is. Does that make sense? OK, so we figure now shape two is the one that we like. But now here comes the secret of life. It's called a signal. It comes from the environment. But the environment has physical signals and energetic signals. I'll show you a physical signal because you can see it. And yet it works the same, actually 100 times more efficient with invisible signals versus chemical signals. But here's how it works. What's the charge at the end of the molecule? This signal is positively charged. But let me give you one additional fact. There's more positive charge in here than negative charge in here. Quantity, more positive than negative, OK? So now watch what happens. The signal moves through space. This is theoretical and doesn't really work that way, but that's what we'll say. OK, the signal moves through space and couples with the protein, positive and negative. It doesn't work that way either, but believe me, that's what we say in the book, OK? <laughs> so now the positive signal bound. What's the charge here? Negative. What's the charge here? Positive. Is this more stable or is this more stable? <laughs> so it, what did it do to go from here to here? It moved. Motion is life. Absence of motion is death basically. So the question is this, what caused life? The answer is a protein that is capable of moving. Yeah, but what causes the protein to move? The signal. You got that? So the fact is, well, how does life work? And the answer is this, a signal binds to a protein, changes the charge, and upon changing the charge causes the backbone of the protein to move, and when the protein backbone moves, the protein changes shape. And when the protein changes shape, the movement is harnessed by the cell to do work. Respiration, digestion, excretion, whatever the heck you want to say. OK? So oh, this is uh, our protein gears. OK? And in these protein gears, this is a protein. And proteins act like lock and key with a signal. The signal comes from the environment. And so the point about it is this. When the signal binds to a protein, the protein changes shape. And when the protein changes shape, it causes the gears to move. And when the signal is gone, what do you think happens? Protein stop. If you want to make this behavior go again, what do you think you need to do? Put another signal back in the field. As another signal joins into the field, the proteins start moving again. You control the behavior of proteins by controlling the presence of the signal. So proteins provide for your structure, but they also provide for your function. Proteins are the translators of the environment into movement. And that's what happens. So it's interesting, here are, are our three proteins, and I'll illustrate them again. We start, each protein is a unique signal. It's like a lock and key. So signal one activates the annexin. Signal two will activate this enzyme, dehydrogenase. Signal three will activate the uh, molecule called calmodulin. And each protein has its own structure, and each protein has its own function, and each one responds to its own signal. OK? Now here comes the important uh, breakthrough. This is a paper by a Dr. Song, and he was working with electromagnetic fields, saying, instead of physical chemicals, can you use an, a field to activate a protein. Well, I love this. Why I'm showing you this article is this. 
is that there's an excerpt right here from the introduction. And Song was talking with a conventional biochemist, a prominent biochemist, and showed him the energy interacting with proteins. And what did the conventional guy say? A prominent biochemist in a recent conversation with the author even labeled study of this type of cell-to-cell -cell communication as astrology <laughs> and maintained that signals could only be carried by the substance of chemistry such as molecules or ions. That's such a profound statement that it may have just passed by you at this moment. What does it mean when the prominent biochemist said that signals can only be carried by the substance of chemistry? Another What's that? Another dogma. It's another dogma about what? That you want to heal yourself and a doctor is going to affect your signal. What does he have to use to affect your signal? Drugs. It is the foundation of why drugs are, are the basis of medicine, because only molecules of chemistry can change the signals. So therefore, drugs are devices to signal your proteins to control them. That's the belief system. And we buy that belief system to the extent that when we look at a protein like this, uh, in the textbook, they always show a physical model of a signal plugging in like a lock and key. And as Lynn said yesterday, what the hell do you think the chances are of two chemicals in a cell finding each other and bumping in and locking into each other? It's insignificant. The reality is this is a belief system that is not right. And the reason why it's not right is this. We bought the belief system because we bought the concept that the universe is made out of matter, Newtonian belief. And therefore, everything is matter, and that's all we need to know about. But the reality is this is not true. We now know this. The universe is made out of energy. That matter is not even real. It's an illusion. And so the fact is, if you bring biology up to the modern physics, then it says energy is the more important control mechanism because everything is made out of energy. We take a look at this picture of a gold atom. There's the atom in the middle. This electron microscope picture. There's the cleaned up version of a gold atom. Looks kind of gold, in fact. There it is. And the reality is that you think that's a physical thing. Well, let me give you an interesting fact. I give you a camera, shrink you down to the size that you could fly through that atom. And I say, go through that atom, and I want you to take pictures of everything you see inside this atom. And when you come back, we'll develop the film. We'll see what's inside an atom. The fact is, while we expected this image here on the left, the Newtonian atom, marbles, ball bearings, and solar system, the truth is there is no structure in a quantum atom. The atom is made out of energy. There is nothing physical, tangible about an atom. And then you might say, but Bruce, oh yeah, if this podium is just made out of energy, put your hand through it. No, I'm not going to put my hand through it because I can't. And you say, oh, why not? It's just energy. <laughs> and I'll tell you why. And I'll use a model to show you. Here's a picture of a tornado. And let's put a little star right here, and I'm going to ask you to do something for me. I want you to get in your car, and I want you to drive 100 miles an hour toward this point right here. When you hit that tornado, are you going to drive through the tornado, yes or no? No, it would be the same as hitting a stone wall. It's a vortex of energy. You can't go through a force field like that. You say, oh, well, but, but that's a physical thing. No, no. That's because the dirt and dust got picked up in the tornado. Here, let's clean out the dirt and dust, all right? And then I ask you, OK, you see this little star? Drive 100 miles an hour across this open field, and what's going to happen when you hit that star? You'll be, boom! And I'll tell you what, it, what the experience may be like. I have a picture window, and birds frequently hit it. I am sure they have that same feeling, hey, boom! <laughs> you can't see it. It's still there. Every atom is a miniature vortex of force field. You cannot push your force field through here at least in our current state of mind. It's changeable. Every atom is a spinning field. Every atom creates waves like ripples in a pond. We focus on the atom. And that's because of our Newtonian idea. Atoms are like billiard balls. Oh, you want to know how atoms work? Well, have them hit each other and then measure their interactions and what happens when they hit. That's a Newtonian belief. Because the reality is an atom is not a billiard ball. An atom in quantum physics is more exactly like the ripples that we just talked about a second ago. So the fact is, it's the ripples. In fact, get rid of the picture of the atom, because it doesn't really exist. 
What interacts is not the atoms. What interacts are the waves that interfere with each other. But what would you call all these waves? Well, you're in this room, you damn well ought to know by now. Lynn wrote the book on it. It's called the field. You want to understand how biology interacts? It interacts with the field because you're looking at an illusion of material reality. It's not really there. So when you look at something like this and you say, oh, a bunch of humans, yeah, that's an illusion. That's not the real picture. You want to see what they really look like? They look something like this. They're all interacting waves with each other. And so the interesting information is that we have been mistaken because we consider biology a Newtonian realm, and there is no Newtonian realm at this level. We are all energy waves interacting. I'm going to try and finish up in just two, two minutes, okay? I got started late two minutes, okay? Sorry. <laughs> <laughs> I'm going to show you an experiment I did uh, after leaving the university. When I was in the university 30 years ago, I, I had the luxury of having at least 50,000 pounds a year back then to work on my research. Uh, now I have uh, 50 pence a year <laughs> to work on my research. But I did this, my own experiment, I paid for it. These are iron filings. I bought a piece of iron, and I bought a file, and I filed them down, made iron dust. So that was a, almost the expensive part of the experiment. Here's what the point is. I take the iron filings, put them in a salt shaker, and sprinkle them on a page. They make a random pile of iron filings. I throw away this pile, I sprinkle it again. Another random pile of iron filings. I throw that away, I sprinkle it again. Every time I sprinkle it, what do you think I end up with? A random pile of iron filings. Now, every now and then, it may look like something, and you say, oh, you know, that, that looks like a fish on a bicycle or something. Uh, but that's called a Rorschach test with iron filings, OK? It's just random. Now, the more expensive part of the experiment, I buy a magnet. And then I cover it with a piece of paper, and I sprinkle the iron filings. Do they fall randomly, yes or no? no. They form a field, and they show the presence of the field. I throw away these iron filings. I do the experiment again. What do you think I get? Same. Same thing. There's something so profound in this, and it's so beautiful and so profound. Look at it. It goes like this. When I just sprinkle the iron filings without a field, I get randomness. But when I sprinkle the filings in a field, I get structure. So matter plus field equals structure. Now, think about it this way. This is very important. Imagine the iron filings are cells. And you want to understand why the cells form this structure. But you don't know the field exists. Can you take apart and study the iron filings and find the structure in the iron filings, yes or no? Yes. No, there's no structure in the filings. The structure comes from the field. Yeah, but biology doesn't recognize the field. So they study your body as iron filings and have no comprehension of why the hell you have the structure you have. And the answer is, it doesn't come from the filings, it comes from the field. And there's a great quote, I couldn't, I, I mean, I couldn't find anything better because it's so beautiful, sublimely beautiful, from Albert Einstein. The field is the sole governing agency of the particle. What is particle? Matter. The field is the sole governing agency of matter. Relevance? If you don't understand the field, you'll never understand the structure of matter. Here's where we left off. We were talking about the fact that signals control proteins. We're talking about the fact that conventional biology and medicine says signals are all chemicals and molecules. But the new physics reveals that that's totally an incorrect assumption. That in fact, that the physics reveals that signals are actually energy vibrations in the field. So rather than focusing on matter, we should be focusing on the field. I just want to bring this paper up. Uh, there in the left-hand corner is, the uh, again, the scientific Latin to not let you know what this paper is all about. But I'll tell you what this paper is about. It's about molecular turnstiles. A molecular turnstile is this, the movement of a molecule. Relevance, this paper was understanding the nature of, under, uh, of looking at the movement. Popfristic and Goodman tried to predict the movement of a molecule moving using Newtonian physics. But they found they couldn't predict any of the, of the movement part. 
So what they had to do was let go of Newtonian physics and say, look at the movement in regard to quantum physics, which instead of focusing on matter, focuses on the field. And they found that they were able then to predict the movement of the molecules using quantum physics. When they published this in Nature, a review was published along with it by the physical chemist Frank Weinhold, a new twist on molecular shape. And this is what he writes. The most quest, uh, pressing question raised by Prof. Fristick and Goodman is when will chemistry textbooks begin to serve as aids rather than barriers to this enriched quantum mechanical perspective on how molecular turnstiles work? Well, that sounds more complicated. Dex, look at the, at the uh, uh, subtitle. What are the forces that control the twisting and folding of molecules into complex shapes? Don't look for the answers in your organic chemistry textbook. There's an important reason for why this is a powerful statement. Medicine is built on the principles of organic chemistry. And therefore, if you really want to understand how life works, then you can't follow the principles of medicine because they're incorrect. You have to go back and look at it now in a new understanding, quantum mechanics. So you take the Newtonian physics out of medicine, you get a new medicine, a medicine based on energy healing, not chemical healing. And this is what this is all about. And that's why it's important when they say that the organic chemistry book is wrong, they also imply that medicine is wrong in its understanding, okay? So the concept of materialism drops out of the picture. Now we're left with an understanding of how life works and now you have more information than the general conventional physician because they're still locked into the mechanical model. So how does it work? You are made out of protein. Yes, we said all your functions and structure come from that. Yeah, but what causes a protein to do a movement? You forgot? It was lunchtime or break, <laughs> what? The signal. <laughs> Where does the signal come from? The field. <laughs> What do you think this whole conference is about? She's standing in a corner over here, pay attention. <laughs> Conventional medicine says, look at the molecules. Uh-uh, don't look at the molecules, look at the energy, look at the field. That's where the new medicine is coming from. And the relevance about that is you bring the energy back in, you bring vital force back into life now. And that's what it's all based on. Forces, vital forces running through the system. So when a signal binds to a protein, what does the protein do? It moves, it changes shape, it creates behavior. Now here's the interesting understanding. If your behavior is off, it's not working right, you have what is called a disease. Now a simple point is this. If you have a disease, now think about this, what can you attribute it to? And the answer is very simple. Back up the arrow and tell me what's on the other side. Well, there's only two things, proteins or signals. Yes. You can have defective proteins. And in fact, a small percentage of the population expresses defective proteins because they were born with birth defects. Problem? Far less than 5% of the people can legitimately tell you that what's going on in my life is due to my genes. 95% or more of us got here with a perfectly adequate set of genes to have a healthy, happy, prosperous life. Well, if you're part of the 95% that got here with the good genes and you have a dis-ease, what can you attribute it to? So don't say protein. <laughs> okay? Ah, you're left with a signal. Ah, so the signal can cause a disease. Yes, three ways that the signal can interfere. Number one, you can interfere with a signal by trauma. If you fall off a curb and wrench your back and cause your spine to be twisted and interfere with the nerve flow, you interfere with the flow of signals. That will cause a disease. Number two, toxins. If you ingest in your system poisonous elements, they can distort a signal, and in so distorting the signal, cause a defect in the behavior. That's obvious. But the most important, beyond any means, the most important of all the problems is related to thought. And auto-suggestion, or basically, mind. And now I'm going to tell you how important it is. Remember I showed you the slide where people drank strychnine? So the fact about toxins, can toxins bother you? Not unless your belief is corrupted. If you have a strong belief in the power of who you are, 
then even a toxin won't affect you. And accidents are not accidents when we get down to the bottom line. It's still all derived from the mind. The mind is the control of life. So then I say, well, okay, let's go into this very quickly. And we say, well, how does life really work? Where, where's the brain of the cell? We thought the nucleus was the brain. No, that's the gonad. So where is the brain? <laughs> the brain of the cell is the membrane. It's the skin of the cell. Relevance about this? In your, remember I told you a cell's a miniature person? Your brain, embryologically, comes from your skin. The brain of the cell, the brain of the human, derived from the skin. They enter, why the skin should be the brain? It's the interface between the outside and the inside. It's the most perfect organ to read both environments at the same time and then make an adjustment. So the skin is the brain. How does it work? Well, we talked about the gears and the signal causing the gears to work. But the protein gears are not out in space, they're inside a cell, so they're underneath a cell membrane. The signal has to come from the environment go through the cell membrane to get to the gears. Well, the relevance about that then is it says, well, how can I control the system? And the answer is, well, the signal from the environment has to get here. The protein gears are what create the behavior. But between the environment and the gears is the membrane. So the membrane has switches built into it. And the switches read the environmental signal and then send a signal inside the cell. I'm gonna show you an example of a single switch. Why is this important for me to point out? It's because on the surface of the cell, there are over 100,000 switches at any time. So it's not the complexity of how a switch works. All switches are simple. The complexity is, out of 100,000 switches, which ones are on and which ones are off, that's complex. But it's, you know, that's really why it's hard to tell what a cell's gonna do. You have to really know to accurately predict what a cell's gonna do what are the positions of 100,000 switches at one point? That's very difficult because the switches are influenced by the environment, so you don't know what's gonna happen. So let me show you how a switch works. It's got two parts. A protein receptor, what, what does the receptor do? Uh, it receives. <laughs> what? Signals. That's why it's got an antenna on it. Protein receptors have antennas that resonate with the environmental signals. When a signal is picked up by the protein, oh my God, I know the break happened, I might have to restart it all over again. Do you remember what happens to a protein when it binds to a signal? You forgot. <laughs> the, it changes shape. So that means a receptor has one shape before a signal and a different shape after the signal. So there's an inactive receptor and an active receptor because the shape changes. When the signal is received by the receptor, that's coming from the environment, the primary signal, it changes shape, couples to an intermediate guy called a processor protein or a G protein, and that connects it to the effector. Oh, what does an effector do? <laughs> Makes an effect. What's the effect? When the effector is activated, it's what sends a secondary signal or second messenger into the cell to drive the protein gears. So the switch works by reading the environment, connecting it to an effector, and the effector sends a secondary signal inside the cell. Does that make sense? Okay. Now, I say, well, what's the name of the switch? So I give it to you in scientific Latin. It says, this is a receptor effector integral membrane protein complex. And you go, right. <laughs> I want to tell you, though, there's a switch name that you're all personally familiar with. I just want, before I tell you the name of the switch, I want you, what does the switch do? It controls functions. How? By responding to environmental signal engaging a function, right? So what's the receptor function? Awareness of the environment. You have receptors, got big ones, eyes, ears, nose, taste, touch, pain, pressure, heat. Where are your receptors built into? The skin, just so you're the cell. You respond to the environment, the signals come in and then you control your function. The effector is what sends a physical sensation into the cell to control the protein gears. So if I define the switch, here's a definition in people terms. The switch represents an awareness of the environment through a physical sensation. And I say, there's a word in the dictionary that you're all familiar with. The word in the dictionary? Perception. Awareness of the elements of environment through physical sensation. What is the name of the switch? What controls behavior? Oh, you got lost already. Okay, wait, there was unity here a minute ago. 
Perception controls behavior. Why? Proteins generate behavior, and the perception switch controls it. So as you perceive the world, you adjust your behavior. So we got this far, and guess what? What about genes? I thought genes were involved. No, genes are not involved. We haven't even talked about genes. But you want to know what genes do? I mean, they're important. I'm not saying they're not. They're profoundly important, but not for this. Genes don't control behavior. Here's what I, when do I need a gene? If one of my proteins is gone and I need to make a protein, that's when I need the DNA, because the DNA is the blueprint to make the proteins. The proteins are the functional element. So I say, okay, I need a protein, so I have to go to the nucleus of the cell. And when I open up the nucleus, I find there are 23 pairs of chromosomes. That's the hereditary stuff. The chromosomes, 23 from your mother, 23 from your father, in the nucleus. And what do they represent? Hereditary material. Yeah, but what are chromosomes made out of? Oh, 50% DNA and 50% protein. Yeah, so you know the DNA is the blueprint, but what about the protein? And here's where the problem comes from. Because we already bought into the reality that DNA controlled life, for 50 years when they want to study life, they open up the nucleus, take out all the chromosomes, they split the DNA away from the protein. They put the DNA into the experiment. They put the protein into the trash bin. Why? It wasn't necessary for them. They were studying DNA. But somebody got wise. Somebody said 50% of the nucleus is protein. is probably more than space filler. It's probably doing something. <laughs> studying the protein changes everything about biology. When the people of this world know about what I'm going to talk about right now, it will change civilization. This is a scientific reality. Why? Because we believe in something called genetic control, which means control by genes. The new science, when you study the proteins, reveal this about proteins. Proteins form a sleeve around the DNA. So to give you a model, here's my arm. It's DNA. Let's write the genetic code. I take a magic marker, and I write the genetic code for blue eyes. And I hold up my arm, I say, can you read the genetic code for blue eyes, yes or no? Yes. yes. Okay, and I say, yeah, but what does it look like when it's back in the nucleus? Oh, well, back in the nucleus, it looks like this. Can you read the genetic code for blue eyes, yes or no? <laughs> if you want to read the genetic code for blue eyes, what do you have to do first? <laughs> What's the sleeve made out of? What caused the protein to change shape? <laughs> the point about it is this, when you want to read a gene, the gene can't be read because it's underneath a sleeve of protein. You have to remove the protein to see the gene. This new science is called epigenetic control. I said, well, what the heck does that mean? Epi is a prefix that means above. Epidermis means the layer above the dermis. So if epi means above, then literally, this says control above the genes. And this is the new science. Why is it different? If genes controlled your life, then you're a victim of heredity. But if the control is not in the genes, and it's above the genes, and something else controls the genes, then there's something different going on. And what is it that controls the genes? Signals from the environment. But how are the signals Cross over into the cell. What's the switch? Perception. Perception. Watch. Chromosome. Linear string of genes, each a blueprint. At the beginning of each gene segment, there's a special protein called a regulatory protein. If I want to read a gene, this is how it works. A signal comes into the nucleus that's derived from the environment. The signal binds to a protein. Yeah, but when a signal binds to a protein, it changes the shape of the protein. And so when the shape of the protein changes, the sleeve pops off. Now you can read the gene. Now that the gene can be read, I send up another protein that will come up here and make a copy of that gene. The copy is what goes into the cell to use as a blueprint. The copy is called RNA. So DNA goes to RNA, and the RNA is then used to make the protein. And when I have the RNA, I don't need the DNA anymore, so the signal pops off, and the gene is covered up. Why is this relevant? For 50 years or more, we talk about gene-controlling life. So look at it this way. Let's root for the gene. Come on, gene. Do your stuff, gene. 
baby, do it. Come on, Gene. Come on, Gene. Gene, do something. Come on, Gene. It's not lit. The gene doesn't do anything. <laughs> the relevance about this is that the genes have no control. The genes are read by the environmental signals. So it's the environment or the perception of the environment that controls genes. Genes have no absolute control. Genes are blueprints. Relevance, go to an architect's office. He's working on a blueprint. You lean over the shoulder and say, excuse me, is that blueprint on or off? Because genes are apparently on and off, right? No, the blueprint on or off, the architect looks at you like, what are you, crazy? There's no on and off. And that's the point. There is no on and off to a gene. A gene is a blueprint. What you really want to know about, who's the contractor? It's the contractor that controls the genes, not the genes control. If genes were self-actualizing, like we say, a gene turned on, gene turned off, then an architect would only have to throw the blueprints into the lot, drive away, come back a month later, and the building will be there. <laughs> That's how we think it works. No, it doesn't. It requires the reading through the environment. So the new understanding goes like this. Old understanding. Uh, and if the projector guy, can you get the white balance back at some point? Here it goes like this. Old story, dogma. DNA goes to RNA, goes to protein. Primacy of DNA. Uh-uh. Why? What did they leave out of the picture? The regulatory proteins, yeah, we forgot about them for 50 years. No, you can't. They're the sleeve. Yeah, but what causes the regulatory proteins to, to remove themselves from the sleeve? The environmental signal. So in the flow of information, is it primacy of DNA? It's primacy of the environment. It's the environment, just like putting the stem cells into, into the environment. It's the environment that controls it. And the relevance about this, you're not controlled by your genes. You're controlled by your influence of the environment, and more specifically, your perception of the environment. Now, this is a most amazing fact now. Through this epigenetic control mechanism, a single gene blueprint, you can read 30,000 different variations from the same blueprint. In other words, the genes aren't, are, are, they might be fixed in the code, but through epigenetics, you can get 30,000 different variations, meaning there is no limitation for what you can do with your genes. You can create anything from these genes. You can come with healthy genes and create a mutant experience. Or, as a, this is a wonderful example, this is a mutant mouse called an agouti. It's uh, very obese, it's got diabetes, different fur color, the agouti mutant. And it's interesting because it's dominant mutation uh, it makes it look different than this normal looking mouse. The only thing is, this is not a normal mouse, this is an agouti mutant. And what's different about it? The mother during gestation was fed those elements that influence epigenetics. Point? Epigenetics can take a good gene and make it read bad, but it can take a bad gene and make it read good. In other words, you are not limited by the genes, you're limited by your perception that controls the genes and controls the behavior. So perception controls genes, and perception also controls behavior. So how does it all work? And it works like this. We have the environment. It has external and internal signals from the environment. But the signals are picked up by the brain. The function of the brain is perception. The brain perceives and interprets the environment. From the perception, the interpretation is manifest by the mind. The mind then sends signals to the brain to release energy uh, vibrations as well as chemistry that alter the behavior and gene activity of your cells. You're not controlled by this, you're controlled by that. You say, the mind, didn't we throw the mind out when Isaac Newton came in? Yeah, Isaac, Newto Isaac Newton's physics said matter only, got rid of the mind. But no, we're in quantum physics land now. And quantum physics has a whole different understanding. Quantum physics says, yes, energy is important, and the mind is an energy field, and it's profoundly important because what? The energy fields control matter. And so we, in quantum physics, we put the mind-body back together again, but not just put it back together, but we prioritize which is more important. And who prioritized it? Albert Einstein. The field is the sole governing agency of the particle, the field is the mind, the particle is the body. The mind controls the body and that's quantum physics. And the reality is we left this out of the control forever. 
and now it's coming back in. And all of you, I saw the number of hands of energy healers here and healers of different kinds. You're essentially working with this level of putting the mind back in order to control the body. Concept of the mind, there's two parts to the mind. The subconscious mind is the original mammalian brain. Now look at the data. It can process 40 million bits of data per second, which means 40 million nerve impulses. The subconscious mind can take 40 million nerve impulses in one second and process all the information. It's very, very fast, but its character, it's totally habitual. It's not creative. The subconscious mind is habitual, okay? But in evolution, most of the brain is all the subconscious, but the evolution revealed that the frontal area of the brain called the prefrontal cortex is where the origin of the self-conscious mind, and that's related to feedback. Consciousness, self-consciousness is feedback of how you fit into the world. So the prefrontal cortex is related with self-consciousness, and I call it an add-on option for this reason. You do not have to be conscious to be a present member of our society, and in fact, most people are not. The difference between the two, though, look at this. Subconscious, 40 million bits of data per second. Conscious mind, 40 bits of data per second. Conscious mind can only juggle a few facts at the same time, you know? <laughs> uh, think about the memory of this capacity when it's raining out and you want to make a phone call and you're trying to look up the telephone number in the book and, and you're trying to get the coin out to put in the thing. Before you can get the coin in there, you can't remember the digits on the phone number. That's the conscious mind. It doesn't have great memory capability at that point. Okay, it's slow, but the unique part, it's creative. It is the creative mind, the subconscious mind is the habitual mind. So when you're operating from consciousness, you have creative capabilities. When you're operating from subconscious, you're a robotic device playing programs, okay? Interesting aspect, what's the difference between 40 bits per second and 40 million bits per second? Imagine this picture of Machu, uh, picture of Machu Picchu having 40 million little pixel dots of color. What this represents is that in 40 million pixel dots in this picture, in one second, the subconscious mind interpreted every pixel dot on this picture. And I say, yeah, but how much in that same time did the conscious mind perceive? Oh, 40 bits. You see that? Okay, I'll put an arrow. See that? See that little dot right there? <laughs> Relevance? All this data is coming in all the time, but your conscious mind can't focus on it. So almost all of the data is being processed by the subconscious mind. The conscious mind can focus on anything and can control anything. Conscious mind can control blood pressure, heart rate, body temperature, anything it focuses on. There's nothing the conscious mind can't control. But the problem is this, because of its small size, it can only control a few things at the same time. All the rest of the control is left up to the subconscious mind. The relevance about this is, again, the subconscious mind was programmed and acquired from other people. So where did the programs come from? When did we start to put the programs in? Here's the most important data. The programming of your subconscious mind was already starting to download habits by the middle of gestation. Bef <laughs> halfway before you were born, you were already downloading information. How did you get this information? Because the fetus is inside the placenta inside the mother. And we talk about the mother providing nutrition from her blood to feed the fetus. But the fact is this, is nutrition the only thing that's in blood, yes or no? Yes. No, the emotional chemicals are in the blood, the hormones, the self-regulating factors that regulate the physiology, they're all in the blood. So when the mother is having an experience, the fetus has exactly the same experience. When the mother is happy, the fetus is happy. When the mother is sad, the fetus is sad. The mother is afraid, the fetus is afraid. If the mother rejects the child, because it might be uh, you know, questioning the survival of the rest of her family, that fetus already is being bathed in rejection emotion. It's already learned that. A great book, just take it down. The name of the book is Why Love Matters by Sue Gerhardt, G-E-A-R-H-A-R-D-T. Very important book about neural development. Talks about the fact that a child's personality is fully halfway developed before it's born. The personality is developed. And you might say, well, why would nature allow this to happen? And the answer is this. Because sperm and egg are generic. Who knows where they're supposed to be born and when they're supposed to be born? 
Who knows what's going on in the world when this baby is going to be born? Because it changes what the baby needs to survive. So nature prepared for that. It made the mother the Head Start program. The mother's perception of the world that she's living in is transmitted to the fetus so that the fetus is getting an experience of the world before it's born so it can adjust its genetics to fit the world. The uh, genetics through epigenetics are adjusted. Parents are genetic engineers. They're shaping their child based on their perception of the world. I said mother, but the father is totally tied into this whole thing. Why? If the father screws up, it messes up the mother, who then sends the signals to the child. So it's the father and the mother that are working on this. The child is responding and learning from midway through pregnancy on. And whatever the child is experiencing then, it changes the genetics of the child to fit that world. And there's a different genetics of a child that has to live in survival versus a child that's given an opportunity for growth. You make a street fighter in a, in a child that's been threatened. Bigger muscles, big hind brain for reflex to fight, compensation, reduced forebrain. A child's intelligence can be reduced 52% by a mother who is living in a fear environment. Why? Shifting into a reflex organism versus a thinking organism, which is supported in a growth environment. But then comes the next important years. And here's what's important. EEG, brain activity, reveals functions of our, of our brain. In a normal situation, uh, how much time do I have? I just want to check that. Uh, quarter past. Quarter past. Ooh, okay, fast. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> that what's happening is that the brain activity is reflected in EEG vibrational frequency. As adults, we have a whole range of activities up and down the scale, all different frequencies. But what's interesting, a child does not express it that way. A child expresses a ramping up of its EEG over its age. So for example, from zero to two, or actually before birth to two, a child is in delta. That's the lowest EEG. If you're in delta, you'd be sleeping or unconscious. It doesn't mean the child's sleeping or unconscious, though. The child, now think about this, the nervous system doesn't develop equally input and output. The nervous system develops first with the inputs, then the outputs. In other words, a child's brain is downloading data even though its muscles are not coordinated. It can't speak, it can't move, it can't coordinate, but it doesn't mean it's not downloading stuff. That part of the brain is working. So up to two years old, a child is like behind a plate glass window. It's observing the world but can't interact with the world. Then from two until six, the brain activity ramps up so its predominant state is theta. Theta is imagination. Of course, child between two and six lives in mixing the world of imagination and the real world. That's where it lives. Then, and only then, after six, it starts to express the next higher level, alpha, which is consciousness. And then by 12, it expresses the next higher level, which is beta, which is like schoolroom consciousness. This is why kids, when they pass this part, go into the next level of school with much more complex work going on. Stop. The child is not in consciousness as we know it for the first six years of its life. And you say, why would that be? And the answer is this. Think it's logic. Consciousness requires thinking. Yes? But if you have no database, what can you think about? Nothing. First you have to have data, then you can have thinking. So the brain is designed for the first six years in low frequencies. You know what these frequencies are? The hypnogogic trance state. A child is in a hypnotic trance for the first six years of its life. It downloads everything it sees and hears and everything you're not thinking. You're, you're thinking you're teaching the child. When you turn your back, the child's still recording everything you're doing. The child records everything, every nuance. It learns everything. And it does so without discrimination. Why? Consciousness hasn't started, started yet. You need consciousness to think about it, but you can't have consciousness unless you have data. So the first six years is data with no discrimination. Whatever is taken in by a child in its first six years is given as a fundamental truth. Whatever it learns is true. It watches how the father responds to the mother, how the mother responds to the father, records that. If it's a boy, that's its story about life. It's going to look for a woman that has the same characteristics as the mother and vice versa. And the idea is that there's no discrimination. The Jesuits, they would say, give us a child until it's six. 
and it will belong to the church for the rest of its life. What did they know? Whatever the first six years are, that's the rest of your subconscious programming unless you change it. If you don't change it, you will have the same behavioral programs you downloaded from your environment in your first six years of your life. And since we have not been conscious about that, we never recognized that the child was recording every word, every movement, every nuance, because it had to learn the rules of life. Because this period is the programmable state of the child. And this is the period where enculturation is learned. This is how do, how do I respond in society? What are the rules? Tell me truth about society, because these truths will become my life. And if we don't tell them truths, we screw the system. Yeah, Santa Claus is really cool. And then you get to six, seven, you find out eight, 